Kashmir was once a mecca for tourists. They were drawn by snow-capped peaks and beautiful lakes. This lake, like uh, it was like paradise, you know, like a jewel in a crown. We used to call it. Sometimes you can watch a fish is going past to you, and uh, and you can take up. You can look up and you can see blue sky, you can look far as far as you can. Round you can see mountains, all the houseboats. How nice is this? I mean, you are all, all, all alone there and think about around you, it's just lake and quietness. Hamid Kankashi was born and bred here. The lakes have been his inspiration and his livelihood. Tourists queued up to rent his houseboats, but not anymore. The threat of war with Pakistan and India's battle with militants in this contested territory has turned Kashmir into an armed camp. Now the only visitors wear helmets and carry automatic weapons, and Hamid is facing financial ruin. It's very bad happening here. It makes me sometimes really cry. The most you can see around the lake here is about 1,000 houseboats around this lake. They are all empty. Even the hotels are empty. All the shopkeepers are crying. Everybody is crying. There is no help from the government. There is no help from any bloody person. Only our ministers today, they said this, tomorrow they said this, but no help. Not help at all. Like the Middle East, Kashmir remains one of the world's most intractable problems. In the 1947 partition of India into India and Pakistan, Kashmir was a majority Muslim state which stayed with India. Pakistan immediately attacked to win back what they believed was rightfully theirs, and India fought back. 55 years and three wars later, a line on the map called the Line of Control now marks the unofficial boundary between the two nations. Kashmir remains bitterly contested by both sides. Both India and Pakistan think that Kashmir, in a sense, completes their nationhood, that it's vital to their sense of nationalism and identity. If there was to be a trigger for all-out war between these nuclear-armed neighbours, it could have been this. A suicide squad is inside the grounds of India's parliament in Delhi. With MPs sheltering in fear of their lives, the attackers are eventually killed. India blames Pakistan-based militants. Delhi responds quickly by sending an estimated quarter of a million troops and 2,000 tanks to the line of control. And the message is clear. Put pressure on Pakistan send out a clear message to Pakistan and I suppose to the international community as well that the 13th of December was a turning point for India and no longer will we tolerate the sort of attacks against India and Indians that we have over the last 20 years starting with Punjab and then Jammu and Kashmir. I think it is because of this that you've seen the speech of General Musharraf on the 12th of January so uh, I don't think we should automatically assume that General Musharraf has uh, has done what he's done with Pakistan because he, he, uh, he wanted to. I think he pretty much was forced in that direction. Kashmir runs in our blood. Ye hamare rago me chalta hai. Koi Pakistani Kashmir se taluk nahi tod sakta. General Musharraf reiterated Pakistan's position on Kashmir to his national audience. He also said the Kashmir cause would not be used as a cover for terrorism. But what followed next created headlines around the world. Now, 
اگر کوئی بھی مدرسہ کوئی انتہا پسندی یا تقریبی کاروائی میں ملوث پایا گیا یا جہاں کسی قسم کے ہتھیار یا ملیٹنٹ ایکٹیویٹی میں ملوث پایا گیا اس کو بند کر دیا جائے گا The general's pledge to crack down on Pakistan-based militant networks was hailed by Western leaders. But Delhi is far more skeptical. Yes, he's very glamorous on TV and, and uh, uh, the international media, particularly the television media, seems to love the way he comes across. But, but that's not enough to run a country. Doesn't sound like you're prepared to be too generous towards him. I've, I've had too, my, too many bitter experiences with what Pakistan has done in Jammu and Kashmir for me to be generous with, with, uh, with anything that comes from Pakistan, unfortunately. Huh? Omar Abdullah is India's Minister of State for External Affairs and part of a Kashmiri political dynasty. Both his grandfather and father, as chief ministers of Kashmir, have pursued autonomy for the state at various stages of their political careers. But as an Indian government minister, Omar Abdullah's focus is Pakistan. Our primary concern with Pakistan is the export of terrorism into Jammu and Kashmir and uh, other parts of India. So what we would really like to see is that commitment from General Musharraf being acted on that Pakistan will no longer be used as a, dis as a source to export terror to, to any other place. And, uh, if, if that is true, then what is happening in Jammu and Kashmir really should, should see a, a marked decline. Are you seeing anything of any indication of that? Uh, too early to tell, for the simple reason that Jammu and Kashmir has had the worst winter for the last 10 years. And with the passes snowed in, it would have been impossible for these people to move across anyway. So I think by about the middle of March, uh, towards April, once the snow start melting, we'll have a very clear idea about uh, what is happening vis-a-vis -vis the people crossing the border and the line of control. Fighting militants in Kashmir is a difficult and very dangerous task. A bomb blast at the state legislature in the capital Srinagar killed 40 people late last year. Srinagar's narrow winding alleys provide ideal cover for militants and many buildings have been torched. We were told that police feared to enter this area. A policeman from this station was killed the day before we filmed. At the Army Museum for Captured Weapons in Srinagar, the magnitude of the problem becomes apparent. Then this is the most popular weapon of Afghans and the Islamic militants. The RPG, you must have seen it in the clippings in Afghanistan. Each, even the young boys are carrying these along with them. Yeah, we've got quite a few number of these Pakistan-made uh, weapons with us. This is a 7.62 mm pistol. It's got the Pak mark, uh, markings on it. Pak made 0 .30 bore. This is not an isolated example. We've uh, captured approximately 4,738 pistols. What, all from Pakistan? All with Pakistan markings. Well, General Musharraf has said he intends to cut down on cross-border terrorism. These things he'll not be able to answer to you. These sort of questions. Oh. Yeah. But I'm talk just, just but restrict to the weapons, that's but, but all. I'm, I'm talking about the level of infiltration. No, no, he, he can. The guided the tour is revealing in more ways than one. The army is hypersensitive about security matters. On several occasions, Major Ajay Pal intervened saying my questions about Islamic suicide squads and levels of infiltration by militants could only be answered by politicians in Delhi. Again, show them the, those training pamphlets. Okay. So, so, those training, printed ones, yeah, printed ones. So we can't say that you have to face a suicide squad. Huh? What is wrong with that? No, no, you, you, you are no... And like this one is for... And these are what the army calls extortion slips, receipt books for donations to militant groups. They show that Kashmir has become a battleground for fundamentalist Islam's holy warriors, who've crossed into Kashmir from Pakistan and Afghanistan. And the whole of organizations, you've got the Hezbollah, the Jammu and Kashmir Liberation Front, 
So this is the Hezbollah here? Yes, this is the Hezbollah out here. But long before yeah. fundamentalists arrived in Kashmir, there was and remains like a this popular is independence Jammu and Kashmir movement. Islamic Jung. Its militant wing, the Jammu Kashmir Liberation Front, or JKLF, took up arms in the late 1980s. Father, the JKLF is led by Yasin Malik. He's currently recovering from a heart operation. So there was no fun when government of India did not provide a space for the non-violent struggle. So there was no fun. So that was the only reason that we started the armed struggle just to convey to the international consciousness and Indian consciousness in particular that we want to be heard. To wear jeweled eyes. While the JKLF fought for independence. Other groups in Kashmir want to unite with Pakistan. The JKLF and the pro-Pakistani forces even fought each other in the early 1990s. Whatever their goal, the Indian Army's response to militants has been brutally simple. Wipe them out. Because after all, the uh, half a million security forces are not here for sightseeing. I mean, they are here to to kill people, to neutralize militancy. And uh, so in that perspective, we, we fear that it will continue. I mean. And the army's campaign comes at enormous cost to ordinary Kashmiris. As this forthcoming documentary shows, it seems as if almost every family has lost a loved one. During their campaign, they have indulged in the unprecedented human rights violations here. I mean, in uh, all sorts of human rights violations, the extrajudicial executions, custodial deaths, uh, torture, then disappearances. We have four to five thousand uh, people who have been arrested by the uh, law enforcement agencies since 1989. These are the name plates, wherein the names of the disappeared persons will be uh, written. Pervez Imroz, a human rights activist, and others sought to erect this here. memorial in Srinagar to the disappeared. The they even the laid the foundations the before the army came and ripped them out. And this is footage the Indian government doesn't want you to see. Shot by a freelance documentary maker, it backs many of the claims by Imroz. Under current restrictions, the finished film would never be shown in India. This village was put to the torch by the army during an operation, and not for the first time. This woman's son was taken away by the army and has never been seen again. Are there occasions when the security forces step out of line? Unfortunately, yes, it does happen. 
but in a fight against terrorism, in a campaign of this nature, it is unfortunate, but there will be uh, uh, innocent civilians caught in, in what happens. We've seen it in Afghanistan as well. Uh, it, it does happen, it's unfortunate, it's, it, it, everything has to be done to avoid it. But uh, you will never have a clear 100% uh, clean record. Because it's been put to me by uh, human rights monitoring groups up there that there are as many as 5,000 people disappeared. And they ascribe that to uh, disappeared by the military. I mean, it's, that's it's, a major it's easy. Issue. It's easy to say that. Uh, I would tell you that all five thousand went across and didn't come back. Uh, who's to say who's right and who's not? It's very cynical uh, to say that this kind of things can happen, or you know, who knows where they have gone, uh, is is very sad. Uh, and I wish uh, my country uh, does not really actually behave like that or, or we. And I, I hope that you would not go back thinking that's what most Indians are like. Uh, I'm very sorry for that. Um, Tuppen Bose is happened. not a Kashmiri, but as a leading human rights activist, he has an important role begin, in this complex issue. And once you start going down the path of, of killing and legitimizing that killing and covering up that killing, uh, then it takes an enormous courage for someone to stand up and say, hey, we just can't do this anymore, stop. Bose has just been nominated as one of four People's Election Commissioners by a Kashmiri coalition of groups called the All Parties Hurriyat Conference. They want Kashmiris to vote on who should represent them if and when India and Pakistan restart talks over the future of the troubled state. Last month, a conference in Kathmandu, organised by Bose, to bring Kashmiris from both sides of the line of control together to discuss these matters, was cancelled by Nepal, according to Bose, after pressure from India. A representative or an officer of the Home Ministry of the Government of Nepal called my office in Kathmandu and said that uh, in response to India's support to Nepal, in its uh, struggle against the Maoist terrorists, uh, Nepal must respond to India's request that the, its territory cannot be allowed to be used for anti-India activity. And it is in that regard that they have decided to, to disallow uh, the holding of this meeting. So we don't, didn't have a choice. Anti-India activity? Yes. That means having a discussion about the future of Kashmir and, uh, yes. and the role of people in that? Yes, uh, obviously, uh, uh, talking peace is, is anti-state. Anti This is the road to Yasin Malik's house, the chairman of the Jammu Kashmir Liberation Front. Despite a deep scepticism about dealing with India, he's renounced the gun and is prepared to talk peace. Malik has become a key member of the Hurriyat. <laughs> In his front yard, goats are being slaughtered as part of the Muslim festival of Eid. Upstairs, Malik is meeting with his supporters. Currently facing murder and kidnapping charges from his days of armed struggle, he's about to leave for Delhi for further court hearings. The case has dragged on for 10 years. He says the Hurriyat is firmly committed to democracy and any talks between India and Pakistan must include Kashmiris. Our constitution is that people should be given a free choice to decide their future. We will accept the democratic decision of the people of Jammu and Kashmir. Because Kashmiri people are the principal party to the Kashmir dispute, so whenever the dialogue will take place, it must be a tripartite dialogue between India, Pakistan and the people of Jammu and Kashmir. 
Back in Delhi, Abdullah Omar says the Hurriyat is nothing more than a front for Pakistan and its aspirations for Kashmir. At the end of the day, the Hurriyat conference has been put here to create trouble for us in India. Today you can't talk to 21 people who have absolutely no claim to representing the people except for the violence and, and the gun that they rely on. I mean, at the end of the day, take the gun away from the Hurriyat conference and they really don't have a leg to stand on. Well, if that is what he says is correct, so why doesn't he let them go uh, and, and conduct this poll? Where is the problem? I would rather have a Hurriyat without the gun uh, than a Hurriyat with the gun. And since he and I agreed that uh, the Hurriyat should not have a gun, and the Hurriyat has come and told me that they, they want to move away from the gun, they want to go to the people and, and participate in this democratic politics, why is the government of India feeling you know, shy about it? Why don't they let them have it? Srinagar is under curfew each night and nothing moves. When the next day comes, Kashmiris go about their business closely watched by the army. Even taking a bus ride means being searched. <laughs> army. Army, you can see, it's, I can tell you it's more than a population here. Army means, as they saying one time, they saying us we are helping to Kashmirian people from this terrorism or whatever you call this. But I don't think they are helping us. They are killing us in one way because uh, we are here pawns. I mean, we have uh, no future, you know. We are like uh, butter for them. They can take us, they can put us anywhere. It's like this. Because they have the guns, they have the power. They are the rulers. They can do anything, but we cannot say them anything. If we say them, then we know we have to die. At the end of winter, Indian-controlled Kashmir is a cold, damp and very unhappy place. Beyond these mountains, the tense standoff between India and Pakistan continues along the line of control. Two hostile armies, each with nuclear weapons. I don't think either side wants wittingly, knowingly, to use nuclear weapons, almost in any circumstance that I can think of. But, you know, in the fog of war, uh, things can go wrong. These things happen by miscalculation. Both sides sort of ro do the drum rolling and up the ante, and then something happens, as it happened in 1965, which pushes them into conflict until they think better of it. and and draw back. This time though, of course, both sides have got nuclear weapons, so it's particularly frightening. The prospect of war and the massive investment in weapons in the region is good news for arms manufacturers. Like bees to the honeypot, they flocked to this arms expo in Delhi last month, offering everything from fighter jets to the latest high-tech camouflage suits. This missile, the BrahMos, is part of India's arsenal. It's not nuclear armed, but with a range of 290 kilometers, it could easily rain down on large cities in Pakistan. Because it's um, uh, supersonic, it has got tremendous advantage, not only the speed and reaching the target faster, it has got a high kill uh, energy, nine times than compared to the subsonic missiles. India is the giant of the subcontinent and spending on defence has increased by more than 17% in its last two budgets. Pakistan also spends vast sums on weapons. Amongst many, the Israelis are enthusiastic about market potential. Hundreds of millions of dollars. We cannot uh, mention names of customers because the policy of the company is not the gear to, to mention the names of customers. But uh, I can. Big, it's big business for you here. Big, very big business. One of the one of the main areas of uh, business and technology 
in Israel, aircraft industries regarding unmanned aerial vehicle. But, now, but good, big business for you on the subcontinent. That's correct. In many countries, many, many countries. It impoverishes both sides uh, when you're looking at uh, poverty uh, or hunger or all of the problems that India and Pakistan have by the bucket load. Peter Preston is a former editor of the Guardian newspaper in Britain. He's been reporting on India and Pakistan for more than 30 years and sometimes ponders a subcontinent free from conflict. Uh, golly, if these two countries uh, weren't in a hostile posture, always shouting or growling at each other, always misunderstanding each other, what on earth would uh, the subcontinent look like? It would look a much more prosperous place, it would look a much more united place, uh, and I know from contacts on both sides that these are families who were split apart. These are friends from school who were split apart in the 1940s. Uh, people uh, want to go uh, to India from Pakistan and vice versa. They want them at an ordinary level to be understanding. Those who wield power in Delhi have heard this type of talk before and aren't concerned. Omar Abdullah, it seems, is firmly focused on the present. Until we see something on the ground that will convince us that General Musharraf means what he says, it is very difficult to, to retrieve anything from this situation. With his business failing and a family to provide for, Hamid Kankashi has no illusions about what all this means for ordinary Kashmiris. The big fight for us this time to make a living, which we don't have. The most important thing, we have to survive our family, our kids, ourselves. When we have no business, what we do? I cannot carry this boat all the way from here to the America or to Germany, please, I have a houseboat, come and stay in my houseboat, it's impossible for me. And there is no people who are going to buy this houseboat for me. So what we can do? We want one Kashmir here. We don't want a Pakistan or India, because if we go with Pakistan, India will never like it. If we go with India, Pakistan will never like it. So the people of Kashmir, especially, um, I don't think the most of people want Pakistan or India. The most of people, they just want Kashmir. And they want to live. That's all they want. <laughs>